right, so uh, good afternoon. Um, so, uh, you know, most of the time when I'm doing uh, public speaking, it's in a very dark room, and I'm in the back of the room with a laser pointer, and I can't see anyone, and so it's a little easier that way. But uh, anyway, uh, it turns out that, uh, that a few rounds of uh, Unreal Tournament is really good uh, relaxation for the uh, four talks. So, uh, <laughs> thanks to whoever set that up. Um, just uh, by way of introduction, I am the, the assistant director at the uh, planetarium here in Nashville. Uh, this is not me. For those of you who didn't catch that reference, I do love my work though. Uh, I wanted to, uh, wanted to do some talk a little bit about uh, kind of old school planetarium technology, then kind of bring us up to the modern day and what we do in Nashville and some of the other technologies that are out there that uh, that make modern planetariums work. And uh, so this, uh, the picture that you're seeing right here is uh, the first Pseudocom Planetarium, which opened in 1952. 20-foot uh, 20, uh, 20 dome uh, made of uh, concrete and uh, limited seating, kind of, kind of crowded there, and then you have this kind of funny looking uh, dodecahedron star projector there in the middle of the room. Uh, pretty much all I could probably do in that room was look at the stars and planets and sun and moon and talk about that. So uh, educational, maybe not as, as exciting as maybe some planetariums are today, at least I hope that they're more exciting these days. Um, this is a picture of my first experience in a planetarium. Uh, this was uh, my college job at the University of North Carolina at the Moorhead Planetarium. A uh, big 68-foot dome and that uh, big uh, monster machine there in the middle of the room is the Carl Zeiss Model 6, which I kind of think of as a, uh, a fine watch about the size of a car. Um, I, I really love these old Zeiss machines. They're beautiful, beautifully engineered. And sadly, they, uh, they removed that machine from the center of the Moorhead Planetarium a few years ago. Um, it was time for it to go, um, but, uh, but I love those machines. And there was a time I used to know which each, of, each and every one of those buttons did on the console there. Um, these days, I just want to forget what the hell it is. Um, this is uh, the Pseudocom Planetarium as of 1994. Um, the uh, old dome you saw was no longer there, and this uh, dome was constructed in 1974. And so you've got sort of uh, the best of 60s, 70s, 80s technology in here. Uh, that uh, uh, star ball in the middle of the room is uh, it's better, but it's kind of a tin can with holes, holes poked in it and a really bright light in the middle of it to show you the stars. And you can probably see maybe about the 3,000 maybe 5,000 stars on the dome using that machine. Uh, you can look all the way around the room there and see lots of uh, very special effects, um, including uh, a, a video projector way up there. And you look right underneath that video projector is a little box right there. That is a warp drive. A friend of mine uh, invented that. Um, basically, it allows you to have uh, streaking stars on the dome like Star Trek. Uh, it was built out of the guts of an old overhead projector. Uh, so, uh, brilliant engineering uh, to, build, to build that special effect. So, lots of special effects all around the room, kind of analog sorts of things, uh, single shot slide projectors, kind of look like fire enhancers to me. Um, and sort of my favorite, the, uh, the BFJ is the uh, baby food jar projectors. Uh, literally, you take a baby food jar, you paint it uh, some swirls on it, you stick a, light, uh, a bright light in the middle of it, and you rotate the jar around the light, and you get all sorts of kind of cool effects on the dome. It's like you're, uh, maybe uh, swirling through the gases in the atmosphere of Jupiter uh, or something like that. You've got some kind of weird sci-fi sort of thing going on. Uh, so really fun kind of uh, home-built effects uh, in lots of these old kind of classic planetariums. But no uh, classic planetarium movie would, be, uh, would be complete without you know, dozens and dozens of placketing slide projectors, uh, all under automation. So during the show you hear <laughs> And then when you finish the show, you send them all to the home project, the home position again. They'll go, kitsch, 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 kitsch. and it's very noisy, kind of fun. But uh, <laughs> anyway, we're kind of, kind of uh, glad we're out of that uh, sort of thing these days. Uh, just one overhead view of the uh, the uh, control console, and you see all the kind of different areas of technology here. Uh, lots of uh, 60s uh, buttons and sliders and things. And if you actually pull those panels open, there's some kind of amazing sp spaghetti wiring in there. Uh, and then you've got a, a, a PC running DOS there on the right, which is uh, the control system. And then if you want to light up that room with uh, colorful lights, you've got hundreds of incandescent light bulbs all around the room. So anyhow, um, that had to go. We had to, uh, we got the word in 2006, we could build a brand new planetarium. So 2007, the claw comes and the claw gets my office first. 
Uh, that's my office. That's my office right there. Uh, and I, I got off the bus to come to work, and my office was already gone. And uh, it was kind of a uh, kind of a, uh, a sad day to see our home disappear like that. But it was good because we got to build this building. And maybe you're from Nashville, you recognize this building, or maybe you're uh, driving down Eighth Avenue, you might see this kind of off uh, off to the side, this uh, pyramid building. And at night, you'll see it lit up with lots of LED lights and different colors. And so that's us. That's the uh, Sudicum Planetarium, our new facility as of 2008. Uh, you look inside, and we've got this uh, wonderful star projector in the middle of the room. I know this is not the greatest picture. It's a little hard to take photos in the planetarium sometimes just because of the lighting. But that machine right there is the uh, Goto Chiron Hybrid Star Projector, which is kind of a mouthful of a name. Uh, but that's the machine that puts the stars on our dome now. Uh, the dome is 63 feet in diameter compared to the 40 feet we had previously. 166 seats. And you may see some of these little uh, boxes here in front of the star projector. And those are all uh, individual projectors to show planets, the sun, and the moon. And they're all under digital control. So you type in the console what date you want. And these things will all zoom to the place where they are in the sky. And does it pretty much instantaneously. So it's a very, very cool system we've got there. Um, we'll uh, focus on the star ball here for a moment. This uh, star machine is actually one of only about 10 or 11 in the world. We happen to have serial number four here in Nashville. So we're very proud to have one of these here. It's the only one outside of Asia of its kind. Now, uh, this is the Chiron star projector made by Goto of Japan. And uh, they've actually gone on to Chiron 2 and Chiron 3. 2 and 3 use LED lights. And Chiron 3 is actually about, I don't know, about half the diameter of this one. It's amazingly small, and it can actually uh, project stars into a dome much bigger than ours. So I'm kind of jealous of that one. But uh, we're very happy with our star projector. Let's see if this, well, it's a little hard to see uh, here in the, in the room, but uh, this is a star field, not of the real sky, but of our star projector sky. And uh, you can see that actually the uh, good number of the six and a half million stars that come from our star projector are along the Milky Way. So you can actually uh, grab some binoculars and look in the planetarium dome and you can see all those uh, stars in the Milky Way individually. And you can actually look at the Andromeda galaxy and see a little spiral structure in there too. Um, so these are really pretty stars. Now, that's not the only system we have in the planetarium. We also have uh, two of these uh, kind of monster video projectors. This is the uh, Sony SRX, and it's about the 10,000 lumens. This thing weighs about 240 pounds, and we've got two of them. And each one takes four input, or actually, yeah, it takes inputs from four different computers to make a 4K by 2K image. And we've got two of these projectors, so eight computers driving the video for the planetarium. Each of those uh, projectors has got a custom fisheye lens on it, which uh, allows us to cover the entire surface of the dome with, uh, with any kind of graphics we want. Now, the, uh, this is called a hybrid planetarium because we're actually are using the star machine and the, the digital system kind of at the same time. And so it might be a little bit hard to see, but you can see those stars coming from the star projector. If you look carefully, you can see the lines connecting the constellations and those lines are coming from the digital system. They're coming from the front and back of the room where the stars are coming from that machine in the center of the room. And so these two, these two completely separate systems are talking to each other. And so when we start to move the star machine around, those animations, those graphics will follow right along with them. And so we're actually, I think, the only uh, large planetarium in the United States that's got this kind of technology where these two systems are working together like this. And of course, uh, you know, in the old style kind of planetarium, you would have, you know, maybe five, six, seven different slide projectors which show one slide and it's arranged in a certain location to put up a constellation figure in that one part of the sky. And you have to have the star projector in exactly the right spot to make that constellation figure work. Well, now we don't have to do that anymore. We can show you all 88 constellation figures, stick figures, uh, uh, mythological figures. We can do, you know, Chinese or Egyptian. Whatever uh, kind of constellation myths, all sorts of things. So it really kind of opens us up to a lot of uh, storytelling in the uh, planetarium. Now, uh, of course, a digital system can also show you uh, digital stars. And so there's actually lots of planetariums out there which only do digital systems. They don't have that big star machine in the room. And that's fine for a lot of people, but that uh, digital stars are still kind of limited because uh, you have a resolution problem. You know, uh, your brightest stars in a digital system are going to be kind of fat and fuzzy. 
And so really, really want to get the really very realistic night sky that only an optical star projector can uh, provide uh, to this day. One of the things that uh, the company Goto likes to uh, pride itself on is having a physical command console in the back of the room. Because, you know, we do have a now a nice point and click GUI where we could drop down and bring up all sorts of digital effects. But when you're in the dark and you're trying to talk about the nighttime sky, you're holding a laser pointer, you've got a microphone, really the last thing you want to do is hunch over the computer screen and start pointing and clicking at stuff. So we've got all these nice buttons and slides and dials uh, available to us for the most common things that we're going to use in the planetarium. And Goto went so far as to actually make all the knobs uh, on the, uh, on the uh, console, different shapes and different sizes, so that when you're in the dark, you feel a knock and say, no, that's not latitude, I want, I want latitude, I need to move over here. So you can actually feel the differences in the knobs in the dark. So that's why they did that. So uh, manual control is very important. Another bit of uh, technology is uh, noise abatement. Sometimes your audience um, gets a little noisy, and sometimes they just need a little help to uh, So the uh, digital soft, the, the software that we're using in our planetarium is called Digistar 5. It's made by a company called Evans & Sutherland out of uh, Salt Lake City. And uh, by far, it's uh, far from the only system out there. It's the one I'm most familiar with because we use it every day. Uh, for that matter, there's other star projector manufacturers out there uh, besides GoTo, of course, do. That name Evans & Sutherland, well, they, uh, that company goes back a ways. Um, they, did, uh, they did some uh, special effects for a uh, popular movie. Anyhow, uh, this is what Digistar 5 looks like from, from uh, underneath the console down in the computer room. Uh, actually, Digistar 5 is just the, uh, the rack on the right, that short one over there. That's Digistar 5. Uh, we upgraded actually last month to D5 uh, from D3. D3 is the rack immediately to the left of D5. And uh, so D3 is retired. It's going to become a record farm someday. I'm hoping very, very soon. Uh, to the left of that is an audio rack, so it's all sorts of audio gear for our uh, 5.1 sound system. And then to the left of that is just some odds and ends, including uh, a computer for our lighting and sound control. And uh, there's a DVD player and even a laser disc player uh, salvaged from the old planetarium. I don't know if I've ever used the laser disc player in the new place, but I guess it's nice to know it's there. Um, anyhow. Um, so in that, diff, in that D5 rack there on the right, there are um, eight graphics computers uh, to feed those two uh, Sony projectors. And each one, each of those uh, computers is, uh, is, is sending out just a piece of that full image for the, uh, the, the, uh, the dome. And so that they've, got, they've got to be in sync with each other. So there's special uh, sync cards in each of those computers which are daisy chained one to the other so that they can actually keep uh, frame by frame uh, sync between all those different devices. Um, because if one, uh, one little eighth of your screen is out of sync, everyone sees it. So Digistar um, does uh, has some really nice kind of real-time effects. Uh, we're actually going to fly off the surface of the Earth here over Nashville, and we're going to fly to Mars. Um, Digistar has, some, uh, has all sorts of databases, uh, planets, asteroid orbits, uh, extrasolar planet database, galaxies, uh, volumetric uh, nebulae and uh, particle systems. Uh, you can actually fly through uh, Saturn's rings and see the particles as you fly through it. Uh, and there's terrain for the Earth, Moon, and Mars. And uh, so we're going to fly up on Mars here and eventually we're going to land at the Velus Marineris and uh, see what that looks like. Uh, Digistar has got its own uh, custom scripting language. And I'm really excited now that D5 also has introduced JavaScript support. So I've been spending the past month uh, writing JavaScript to uh, help out things in the dome. Uh, it also uh, also does Python, although I don't really know, know Python well enough to uh, to do much damage there. Anyway, we're gonna fly down to this gigantic canyon on Mars and see we've got some real terrain there. Uh, besides that kind of real-time sort of uh, graphics that we have, we also will just play back pre-rendered uh, programs as uh, a series of eight MPEG streams per computer and stitched together on the dome. This is a show we're running right now called Dynamic Earth, and there's lots of really cool supercomputer simulations of uh, ocean currents and weather patterns and things, and there's also some great uh, CGI uh, sea creatures and things like that. Um, the format that you're seeing here, by the way, it, you'll see this kind of circle. This circle kind of represents the outer edge of the dome. And so 
what you're seeing down here at the bottom of the circle is in front of the dome, it's in front of the audience. Stuff at the top of the circle right there is stuff that's behind the audience. So when we're kind of working on planetarium shows, you have to kind of remember to, to work this, uh, this circle around your head to kind of figure out what you're doing. Um, so it makes a little bit more sense that way. Uh, shows are typically output as uh, big old image sequences, uh, so you might get a stack of you know, several tens of thousands of JPEG frames or ping frames or TIFFs or targets or whatever. Uh, and they're usually 30 frames per second, although uh, we've done some work in 60 frames per second also. Uh, so it's a kind of the common frame rates. Uh, and then once you get that stack of dome masters, all those, all those image files, then they get encoded into whatever playback system you have. There's way too many standards for playback, playing back uh, video in the planetarium. Uh, so it just kind of depends on what dome you've got as far as uh, how you uh, encode for them. So we'll talk resolution a little bit. Our, our planetarium dome is, uh, has a resolution of uh, 4K, that's uh, 4,096 pixels across, east to west and north to south. And so that's that uh, pink circle there you see near the top. And you can kind of compare that to HD and uh, 4K uh, monitors that you might have. And so, um, you know, 4K is kind of, the the, kind of the sweet spot. There's some smaller planetariums out there down to maybe 1K, but uh, those get a little bit fuzzy uh, looking. So 4K is a nice, nice, way to, nice, nice way to be. 8K exists. There are just a small handful of uh, planetariums out there that do 8K. Uh, actually, the Adler Planetarium in Chicago has an 8K theater, and they get away with it because they have 20 separate projectors in their theater and 20 computers to drive it, and I can't imagine the headaches that it must cause. Um, trying to keep those things aligned. I believe there's some automatic alignment software out there that they use, uh, but even then, I mean, you know, one computer goes down, you've got a big hole in the, uh, in the, in the screen, so uh, uh, that's just too many to me, I think, but uh, that may be, 8K may be where, the, uh, where we're going. The other problem with 8K, of course, is production costs. And uh, as every time you double the pixels, the, uh, the uh, production time and uh, storage space goes up exponentially. So the question is, is you know, if we're all doing 8K, is that finally enough pixels? Or are we going to need more pixels? Well, there's some uh, folks at the National Space Center in Leicester, England, who did a little bit of a, uh, a study on this. And they figured out, uh, to use Apple's parlance, if you're sitting in the center of the room of a dome, 16K pixels will be retina. In other words, that you wouldn't need any more pixels. You can see as much as you can. Um, I don't know anyone who's even thinking of doing 16K yet. Uh, you know, 8K is already kind of crazy uh, for right now. And uh, then they, they went a little bit further and said, okay, what if you're in the front row? What if you're right next to the dome? What kind of resolution would you need then? It's something like uh, 70,000 pixels. Uh, so yeah, not, uh, not in our lifetimes, I don't think, anyhow. Famous last words. Anyhow, um, so uh, we produce our own planetarium shows at the Sudicum Planetarium. Um, we will lease and purchase other shows we run, but we do produce our own. And so our most recent production was called Rusty Rocket Slash Blast, based on a slide program we did back in the 90s. So we uh, kind of started from the beginning with uh, the uh, uh, fixing up the script and making sure Pluto is not a planet anymore, sadly. Uh, making sure that Jupiter has the right number of moons and so forth. Um, anyhow, um, and you know, re-recorded the audio track and redid all the graphics, and I did all, almost all the animation in this show, except for the character animation of uh, Rusty Rocket himself. Uh, incidentally, I don't know where Rusty Rocket got his, I don't know where Russell Brand got his Twitter handle. I'm a little annoyed at that. Um, all I know is that Rusty Rocket really wants that verified tag. Uh, anyhow. So uh, in the story of Rusty Rocket, uh, which is kind of a, a show for uh, kind of third to fifth grade primarily, although we do bring it in for we do the, bring the public in for it, and adults love it too. Uh, the story is Rusty is going to Rusty is a teacher. He's a rocket, but he's also a teacher. He's going to be taking a, a group of rocket rookies on their tour of the solar system, so they can learn all about it and find out how far away all those planets are. And uh, so we just they explore the solar system and the spacecraft that have come before. The kind of miniature story around this is that Rusty is, uh, is planning to retire from teaching. And the kind of beginning of the show, he's daydreaming about all the things he's going to do when he has all his free time. So he's going to hang out with the Grand Rockets. He's going to go scuba diving. Um, he's going to go out in the open road. Um, funny thing about that uh, the car down there, that car 
we needed a picture of a car that Rusty, Rusty could drive in, and uh, well, you know, I, we love you know, Scott, you know, you know, Creative Commons images, but we couldn't find the car that was right at the, at the right angle that we had rights to use with the right lighting and the right background. So we actually traveled to the Nashville, the National Corvette Museum in Bowling Green, Kentucky, and so this is the 1.5 million uh, Corvette ever made, which then about a year later fell in a hole. Oh. You heard about that, right? That big sinkhole there. Uh, yeah, that was. That was one of the cars that fell, so we're sad, we're sad about that. But we're glad Rusty got a chance to uh, drive around. <laughs> uh, this show is uh, almost entirely made in Adobe After Effects with some other, you know, Photoshop and Illustrator kind of helping along too, and some specialized plugins to kind of help with the uh, the bending of images so they look right. I mean, you might notice that Rusty's car looks a little bit curved like that. Uh, that's because we're intending to show this on a curved screen, and so you have to bend it first to get it on the dome master image right there before you can project it on the dome. When you project it on the dome, it's, he's going to flatten out and it's going to look like he's riding in a normal shaped car again. Um, so some important plugins for a full dome production uh, if you're going to do it through After Effects. I think I'm, I don't, there are not a lot of people do stuff through After Effects for the, for the planetarium, um, but uh, I decided to do, do it in kind of a strange way. Anyway, so you've got CG modeling, um, you've got uh, character animation like in Rusty Rocket. Um, so how about, how about some live video? Well, the problem is, you know, you've got still cameras which could probably you stick a, a fisheye lens on a still camera. You could probably get to that 4K image, but there's no, um, there's no video camera right now that's got that 4K vertical resolution, so you can just stick a fisheye lens on it and get that many pixels. Uh, you can do it with a 2K, uh, a 2K dome, and it looks a little fuzzy, but it still looks all, it looks all right on a 4K dome, but it's going to be just a little bit fuzzy. So there's no 4K solution yet. It may be a while before that happens. Uh, some people are using uh, red cameras, which uh, and they will uh, do live action shots in front of green screens, and it'll take that imagery and then composite it into a, a 3D scene on top of that. So that may be a way to uh, to get around that lack of a really big, uh, gigantic, uh, 4K tall uh, video camera. Okay. So here's another thing you could do. You could get a bunch of GoPros and slap them together into a cube, like the uh, Freedom 360 over here on the left. Um, the uh, one on the right there is called the Jaunt VR. I actually went to the Nashville Virtual Reality Meetup a, a week or two ago and saw a little demonstration of one of these guys. And it looks like it's just uh, more GoPros in there. Um, but the idea is you take all you take video from all those GoPros simultaneously, stitch them together in post, and you get a uh, get a get some video back, and it, that will support 4K. There are some drawbacks, but uh, you know what? The um, we got to borrow one of these, and we took it out to Nashville's Parthenon, and uh, took some uh, took some video there, and it looks kind of like this. It works pretty well. Uh, as it turns out, Athena, for better or worse, does not move around a whole lot, so we had to uh, uh, you move the camera instead. And uh, here in a second, we'll see a, a, a better view. Uh, we actually, uh, here in a second, you'll see it. We uh, took the, uh, the, Go, the uh, GoPro rig, the Freedom 360, and stuck it through the sunroof of the car and drove down Broadway. And it looks like this. of the hockey tongs as you drive by and see what's going on inside. So, uh, it's also a little bit uh, wobbly, um, just I think probably because uh, I think the car needs a better suspension. So we don't own this uh, this particular GoPro rig yet. Um, it's, uh, I think the, the rig and the software total, I think they're gonna, it's going to cost about $10,000. So I think we kind of need the, uh, the, I, the big idea that why we need it first before we just go out and buy it. PT GUI Pro is uh, uh, one of the uh, bits of software that you might use to uh, stitch all those video streams together. Another thing we did uh, recently, we had a uh, Doctor Who event at the Adventure Science Center, which is a really fun, popular night. And in case you're curious about it, uh, Doctor Who night is going to come back in January. Um, and so I decided I kind of wanted to make the, uh, the inside of the planetarium look like the inside of the TARDIS. I mean, I kind of think the planetarium is bigger on the inside, if you want to think of it that way. Um, so I uh, found a uh, 
Easter egg on Google Street View. There's a blue box sitting on by the side of the road in London, and you walk inside, and you can go through the TARDIS and kind of wander around. And I figured out a way to uh, get that image out of Google Street View into uh, this format, an equal rectangular format like so. And then from there, it's just a matter of uh, warping it into uh, this uh, hemispherical image like so. I do document this on my website, evenscanon.com. So if you're kind of curious how to get images out of Google Street View, you can uh, go there and try it out. A uh, colleague of mine uh, actually did this. He did a uh, Google Street View full dome hyperlapse. There's a lot of words in that sentence. Um, anyhow, I want to learn how to do this. because, uh, And if anyone knows the Google Maps API really well, I'd love to talk with you about how to actually, uh, how you might do this a little more efficiently than he did, which was just go to each individual location, run the little script, and then go to the next location. I'd love to automate it so I can just have a path that goes around town and grabs all this imagery. Um, but at the moment, I don't know how to do that. So we've got some, uh, some possible uh, possibilities for things that uh, can be uh, played on the dome which aren't uh, necessarily science museum kinds of programming. And I love this uh, quote from uh, uh, Spielberg about how maybe one day we'll all be watching movies in a format like this. And so uh, kind of in that spirit, we're starting something, and this is the, this is the shameless plug coming, by the way. Um, we're starting something in Nashville called Dome Club, which is kind of a venue for showing programming that's been made for Full Dome, which isn't necessarily kind of science center material. Um, and so uh, we just started earlier this month, and we've got some cool programs coming up in November, and uh, we're going to skip December. We're going to go in January, and essentially every month after that. And so uh, arts, entertainment, kind of experimental stuff. We know that there's some people doing kind of DJ work in smaller domes, um, and so doing live videos uh, to music. Uh, that's kind of exciting. Um, I haven't seen that done personally yet, and uh, there may be some technical problems with getting that done in our dome, but I'd love to try it. Uh, there's a show, uh, this is actually what we ran uh, in a couple weeks ago called uh, Homegrown Dome, which is a compilation of uh, about 14 different shorts from different animators all around the world, and they're doing some uh, pretty cool innovative stuff. And this stuff that you see here is actually a little bit old. Some of these clips are between uh, ten and uh, five and ten years old, and so there's more and more stuff that's being made now. Uh, and I think this production is really accelerating. And so we want to provide that venue uh, so that people can come see it, because uh, a lot of it doesn't get seen outside of uh, film festivals in planetariums, and there aren't a lot of those uh, yet. So uh, basically. Um, we definitely want you to come by and see what we're doing. Um, I will say that if you're kind of wondering if maybe Spielberg is right and uh, that the the, uh, the full dome is the future of uh, interactive uh, or the the, the 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 future of cinema, well, I don't know if that's true, but this exists. Uh, this actually ran at the uh, Comic Con in San Diego in July, and you can actually uh, search this on YouTube and see it. It's, it's uh, you know it's, someone took a you know just a handheld camera and uh, took a video of it, but uh, it's kind of funny. Anyway, um, I know that somewhere in my uh, in the uh, description for this talk I said something about Oculus Rift, and then I realized I didn't really have much to say about it. Um, it might be a really nice preview tool. I've used an Oculus Rift for about 30 seconds in my life, um, but the idea is that you could, if you're sitting somewhere at your computer station and you're trying to produce a full dome show, and you don't happen to have a dome right next to you, you put on the Oculus Rift and look around and maybe get an idea of what it's going to look like when, once you do get it to a dome. Um, anyhow, I uh, thought I was going to have uh, 20 minutes to talk. I actually had more than that, so I'm open to questions. Um, uh, if there's any questions at all? Anything? Uh, yes? Did your 30 seconds of Oculus Rift change your life? <laughs> um, no, but give me another 30 seconds in mind, yeah. It was, it, was pretty, it was pretty awesome, yeah. I'd, I'd love to try it some more. How real was it? Um, I, think, I think it was on a, um, a, a DK1 at the time, so it was a little pixelated. But um, I'm, uh, And unfortunately, I did, even though I went to the VR meetup group uh, a couple weeks ago, I didn't actually get a chance to see it there. But I hear it's a lot better, and I'm uh, looking forward to trying it some more. Um, so if you're in Nashville, there is a, there is a brand new meetup group for, uh, for virtual reality. 
So uh, it looks like they've already got a lot of people showing up for it. I think there was like 40 people last time. So it's really nice. I'm surprised that the one big question is, uh, hasn't been, can you play games on this thing? Yeah. <laughs> Come on. Um, and the answer is, kind of. Um, actually, Digistar 5, as it comes shipped uh, with, uh, with JavaScript, has a JavaScript implementation of Pong, which you can play with a uh, Microsoft Connect. I haven't tried it yet. I actually don't have access to a Connect yet. I may borrow one just to bring it in and see, but we really haven't had time to, to mess with that yet. Um, I know with smaller domes, uh, definitely, if you have uh, fewer uh, video inputs, I mean, like I said, we've got, to, we've, got to, we've got to be able to split the input and output to eight different computers. So that might be a little bit tricky uh, for a start. But a small dome, sure, if you've got a, uh, if you've got a planetarium uh, with a, a small enough um, uh, number of projectors and you've got a game which can go to that, uh, that kind of fish eye uh, view, 180 degree field of view, uh, sure, you can probably do it, yeah. And I think there's some people who have tried that. Quite similar, be cool, yeah. Do you know when the first aquarium, or excuse me, planetarium existed in the world? Or oh, the first. You're showing the, first, the older pictures. I'm just yeah, curious. the first. Yeah, the first planetarium. I think. Um, I want to say, and I don't. I don't remember the timing exactly. I think um, uh, probably in Germany, and I'm trying to remember what the what the timing was. Probably. Um, I, I, I'm I'm suddenly drawing a blank on what it was. I'm thinking maybe the 20s or maybe before that. Um, I know that in Chicago they've got something called the Atwood Sphere, which is just a big metal ball that you sit in and they roll the ball around you and the ball has little pinholes in it, and so it could uh, it could uh, simulate the uh, rising and setting of stars that way. Um, I think yeah, I think the problem was the Carl Zeiss company that made the first sort of star ball projector, uh, the Mark One. Um, and I want to say that might have been in the 20s or something like that. And it kind of depends on what you define as planetarium also. Um, you know, does that Edward Sphere, you know, the big metal ball just sit in there with, with holes drilled in it, uh, that just said, does that count? Eh, I guess it kind of counts. Uh, but then maybe uh, does just a ceiling with stars uh, painted on it count? Well, I guess maybe sort of. Um, one of the, the maintenance on your equipment, you showed us the racks. Yeah. What is your like replacement cycle? Your failures, all that type of thing. What do you run into? Um, the sorts of uh, sorts of equipment failures. Uh, of course, lamp hours is a big thing. Those two Sony's. Uh, you have to replace those lamps every. Uh, I'm trying to remember how many, many uh, hours that is. Um, like 700 hours or something like that. You have to replace those Sony lamps and those housings. That every every few times that you replace the lamps, you actually have to replace the housings also. And in a few years, a couple years from now, those Sony projectors themselves are going to have to get replaced too. So we're on the hunt right now for the right projectors that, that will provide the right uh, brightness, hoping that something can be brighter than we've got now that provides a really good contrast ratio. Um, because, you know, if you're trying to show the nighttime sky and your darks are kind of gray, that doesn't look really good. Um, so you want a really good contrast ratio in, in, those, in those projectors. And um, you know the lifetime of the lamps, the cost of the lamps, that kind of thing. So we're we're looking to find that right thing that we can afford uh, to replace our uh, uh, our Sony's with eventually. Uh, the star machine also has a has a, uh, a kind of more traditional lamp in it that we have to change every now and again. And I forget how often it is, but not too often. Um, but uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm like I'm a little jealous of those LED star projectors that they've got now, which you, you never have to replace the lamps ever. So. Uh, other than that, I think the big uh, maintenance thing we've had to deal with is hard drives. Uh, we, uh, you know, especially in the Digistar 3 system, we uh, had some two terabyte hard drives uh, from a certain company that um, uh, they started to go bad very quickly. And uh, we had to actually replace all of them. We actually had to convince them, yes, you actually do need to replace this because the whole batch of them is bad. Um, so, uh, you know, that happened. Aside from that, um, and uh, after after several years, we started to lose video cards one at a time, and that's got replaced. But not too many of those. That's that it. Um, my uh, my boss told me when she hired me first, you know, your day, your job in the planetarium. Some days you're gonna be exploring the universe, and some days you're gonna be scraping chewing gum off the floor. <laughs> that's about true. All right. Anything else?
Um, happy to talk with you afterwards. I actually, unfortunately, I'm not going to get to stay the whole conference. I'm going to have to leave probably around 4 o'clock or so today, but uh, love to talk with you individually. And we definitely want you to come by, uh, see the planetarium, and if you're from out of town, see your local planetarium, because they want to see you too. All right. Thanks.